Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Big Read Lakeshore author event with George O'Connor uh, titled Myth Conceptions. Hey. Um, I'm Kelly Jacobsma, Dean of Libraries, and I'm very excited to um, introduce today, uh, tonight's speaker. George is an author, illustrator, cartoonist. Above all, George is a Greek mythology buff. Does anybody ever say geek? Um, yeah. yeah, geek. Um, and a classic superhero comics fan, uh, thus the connection with our big read novel, um, Circe by Madeline Miller. In his New York Times best-selling Olympian series, um, George draws upon primary documents to reconstruct and retell classic myths. As a librarian, I love that he is pulling from primary sources and retelling stories that engage new generations of readers, right? Um, in his first graphic novel, I kind of geeked out when I heard this, um, Journey into Mohawk Country, um, he used as its sole text the actual historical journal of the 17th century Dutch trader, Harman Menditz van der Bogue. Did I get van even? Boga. Van der Bogue? Van der Bogue. Anyway, it's a true story about how New York almost was not uh, founded. So um, that's I'm, I've got that on Interlibrary Loan. Um, in addition to reading his, gra his graphic novel career, uh, George has published several children's books, including New York Times bestselling Kapow, Sally and Something, If I Had a Raptor, and If I Had a Triceratops. Um, and I actually did not realize what a huge fan base George had until I've seen some of the reaction from kids um, that he's met along the way today. So with that, please welcome George O'Connor. Thank you. All right. I think one of the reasons I get along with kids so well is they're the only people I ever meet who can actually discuss Greek mythology on the same level as me. <laughs> so uh, I very hoity-toitily called this myth conceptions, and I have a very fancy font here. Let's see if it works. It does work, okay. So hi, uh, my name is George O'Connor. I am the author and artist, or the cartoonist as I prefer to say, of the Olympians graphic novel series. This is the uh, family portrait of the gods I drew. I should say this up front, because sometimes I get through my entire presentation and someone's like, wait, you drew these books? I'm like, yeah. I wrote and draw these books. Like, a cartoonist is somebody who uses words and pictures to come together to tell a story. And before we go any further, I have a confession. So I have been brought out here by the great people at Hope College as part of the Big Read celebrating Madeline Miller's amazing Circe novel. Circe does not appear anywhere in my graphic novels. I know, it's like, what am I doing here? Do you all know what imposter syndrome is? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> it's okay though, because I'm, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of spoiler. You're gonna hear the most amazing Madeline Miller-centric story as part of this. It's an absolutely true story, backed up with photographic proof. But unfortunately, the character of Cersei does not appear anywhere in my book, so why am I talking here? I'm here to talk basically about the only things I'm really equipped to talk about, the only things I'm allowed to talk about, the only things I'm fit to talk about, myself, and uh, Greek mythology, and comics, and kind of how they all come together, specifically the way mythology still informs us to this day, the way that I feel comics as an art form is the best way to tell this, and then I put myself in there because I'm a bit of an egomaniac. And just to get you on my side, I'm gonna start off with a cute picture of me as a baby. Aww. Right, it makes you feel more inclined to like me, right? Because like, before you're like, this guy keeps talking about himself. But so this is just part of the steps of, can you see that okay? It's a little dark, right? We can see it okay, right? I'm Okay, I'm underneath here. So. This is me at, I'm actually not sure how old because I'm really bad at telling ages. I think three or four maybe. I'm very meticulously coloring inside the lines of my Sesame Street coloring book. Grover, the best Muppet, come at me if you disagree. He's definitely the best, I'm sorry. But this is me, this is, and this is my moment of where I find my greatest happiness, my most peace, and my most sincere concentration. 
I've mentioned this several times to people if you've encountered me. If you see me drawing, it's probably the most I'm going to pay attention to anything. Not just what I'm drawing, but I have an ability to hear everything going around me to an uncanny degree while I'm drawing. This was my spot that I found my peace in. And you can already see, I have this amazing level. This is just where I found my happiness. And I got a little bit older. I grew up in New York. You could tell by my hat. You know, everyone in New York has to wear hats like that. This drawing, well, this is me at my drawing board. And what's really exciting about this, and I have a laser I'm going to show you, is it's just a random picture of me at my mom's drawing board. Here's my, part of my origin story. The house I grew up in New York, before it was my house, it had been a print shop. It went out of business, and when they moved out, they left in the basement all these reams of giant paper they had print signs on. So every day, I would go and I would draw on this. Now, quick question for the audience. How many of you all like to draw? This is good turnout, yep. <laughs> so if you're like me, though, when you were, especially when you're little, it's hard to engage with a giant piece of paper. So I would draw lots of little pictures next to each other on the piece of paper. And this kind of became my first comics, before I even knew what comics were. Remember, oh, and let me just say this, too. I'm going to use these terms interchangeably. Comics, graphic novels, uh, sequential art, they all mean the same thing to me. It's telling stories with pictures and words. I don't even know how to write yet, but I'm using these stories next to each other, these pictures. At first, they weren't a story altogether. But because it was on one big piece of paper, characters from one would appear in others, would appear in others, and I started telling whole stories. And this was something, and every day I would draw this, and I would show my mom and dad, and be like, look, I drew this story. What's really cool about this, just by random luck, it captures my first two characters I ever created. There's this guy who has the long neck and the weird like, kind of horns in the back of his head and this guy who looks like a, maybe a crocodile. I was my parents' first kid. They had me when they were pretty young. And like for many of you who are first time parents, it's that first kid that you really get stressed out about. It's the one you're really worried about. By the time the third kid goes around, you're like, yeah, go play with those rusty scissors. Who cares? But with me, you know, so my parents kept an eye on me very closely. They would put me to bed every night at 7.30, and they would keep the lights on in the hallway so they could just walk by and make sure I was OK, you know, that no like, boogeyman got me or something. And because the light was on, and because I was, it was 7.30, and the Muppet Show had just ended, and I wasn't ready to go to bed, I would just sit there, and I would make shadow puppets on the wall. So this guy, he was the good guy. That long neck is my forearm. And this is him. Can you see it? He had the things back, and he had a little eye, and he would talk. And the other guy, the bad guy, he was like this. He had the teeth that came down. And I would make up these crazy stories, and then in the morning, I would go and draw these adventures of them. This is me starting to use comics, starting to tell stories with pictures before I even knew how to write, right? So then, you know, not much has changed. <laughs> That's the least, well, no, you'll see a worse photo of me as this goes on. Let's go back to there. I talked enough about that. Um, I got a little bit older. Still obsessed with the idea of using pictures to show a story to show moments in time. Uh, as you may have guessed, based on the sort of stuff I do, I was really into swords and monsters. Like we were talking before, Dungeons and Dragons, even though I didn't play it, that sort of stuff was very interesting to me. Do you all know He-Man and the Masters of the Universe? My gosh. If you look online, you see a picture, just type in George O'Connor He-Man. There's pictures of me in front of my wall. I have like all the He-Man figures. I'm obsessed with it. I love this sort of stuff. Sword and sorcery, monsters, monsters killing muscle men. This is what I drew. But it's a little hard to see, but I think you can make it out here. I'm showing multiple moments in time with this already. So you have the muscle man with his arm back, the muscle man with his arm forward. He's cutting off the arm. It's very violent. I apologize. Uh, this dude is shooting the this, this spears out of his feet at this guy. This is the sort of stuff I'm creating. I'm obsessed with this. And here's another confession. This isn't the main confession. This is a mini confession. Actually, can all authority figures please cover your eyes for a second? How many of you are the kid who sits in the back of class and uh, draws pictures instead of paying attention? You can do it. Safe spot. Nice, nice. It's, well, here's a warning, too. As a person who now spends a lot of time standing in front of a class watching people, you can always tell when they're drawing. Like, I was so, like, after the fact, so sad. I'm like, oh, all those times I was drawing terrible pictures of my teachers. They could see everything. So I was definitely that kid. I also definitely could have been a kid who I was, I was a very bright, very verbal kid who was very engaged in speaking with adults. That picture of me drawing, remember, when I was listening about stuff? I would listen intently to everyone going around me and was always very conscious of these things. It made me a kid who could have very easily slipped through the cracks in many ways. 
But when I was in third grade, I was in a class, no, not, not an actual photo. In third grade, I was part of a group called, a, a special prototype program in my school that was called STEPS. STEPS was an acronym. I do not know what the acronym means anymore. But the woman who created STEPS and was the instructor was Mrs. Grace Stimilli. If you have a copy of my book, Hermes, my book is dedicated to her because this book was so important in making me who I am. Uh, like I said, bright kid who liked to draw, but maybe liked to talk too much, and then sometimes didn't like to talk at all. We would start off each class in like a circle. We would do free writing in like the journals that we actually had to hand sew ourselves. Uh, we would study projects, like big things. Like we studied, I grew up in New York, as you could, oh, you can't tell in that hat, but like we studied the Algonquin and Iroquois people, and from that we studied like, you know, the history of the United States and Iroquois place names and pictograph languages and all these things. It would all tie in together. And for me, that holistic whole made it really click for me. And then this one day in third grade, I remember this so clearly. I'm sitting in the back of the class drawing like a cyclops eating a dude's belly. And it's coming out pretty good. And I'm paying attention, but I'm not paying 100% attention because that's just the way I do it. And Mrs. Stimilli is like, listen up, class, listen up. And I'm kind of listening because I'm at the good part of the drawing. And she's like, we're going to be spending the rest of the year studying Greek mythology. We're going to be drawing muscle men fighting monsters. And like little third grade George had his big eureka moment. Like I practically jumped out of the seat. Like I didn't know much about Greek mythology yet. But learning these stories focused my attentions, gave me a love for learning and research and everything that never went away and has grown since then. The, the shoddy Photoshop recreation here, I had to do an oral report dressed up as my favorite Greek god. Actually, as it works out, I was standing on a stage about this high. But let me address some of the inaccuracies, because I'm a very factually accurate gentleman, not given to reckless exaggeration, so let me address them. I did not have a winged helmet. I had a winged baseball hat someone bought me at Disney World. Uh, my caduceus, I made my own one out of green paper snakes and a coat hanger. Instead of winged sandals, I had like a Clash of the Titans pegasus that the wings popped out the side of. I was going to tie it on my feet with golden shoelaces, but I totally forgot it that day and instead just taped loose leaf to my feet. And the part that's really key to me, my personality, will help you understand the sort of person I am, as I stood on this little stage of everybody I knew, I was wearing uh, a towel and no pants. Because <laughs> that's the way they did it. I wanted realism. So I'm in front of everyone I know on this little stage, my little tidy whities underneath my, because yeah, people sometimes get really worried, like, wait, you were wearing nothing? I'm like, no, of course, I'm not an animal. Tidy whities with like little <laughs> towel around it, stuff taped to my feet. I'm shaking a coat hanger. I have this ridiculous hat on my head. For a lot of people, that's a potentially traumatic story. That's like definitely the story they grew up to tell their therapist about. Like, that's the day it all went wrong. But for me, it was like this huge moment where I'm like, yes, this is it. This is what I want to do. And so <laughs> you see me in front of you. Not, not, I'm wearing pants now, though. At least I got that. So my introduction to Greek mythology continued. And it became like a, a real, my entire life has been about books. I've always been in love with books. Like, this was one, has, have you all read this book? So if you've never read Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths, look, I'll, be, I'll admit, the artwork's kind of clunky and weird in some spots, but this book does such a great job of taking all the disparate threads of, that make up Greek mythology and knitting it into one narrative. So much so that, like, actually, this, the New York Times contacted me a few years ago about, like, they said, like, we're going to give you a page to draw a comic about any book you want. Any book that's ever been written, you could do a thing about. I was going to be like, I'm doing Dallaire's. Because Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths it, it, it set for my young mind such an important step of like how understanding Greek mythology as a whole, as the individual stories, the way it informed my understanding of a whole way of life that disappeared, a whole culture that informed ours in some ways. I, couldn't, it, I can't impress upon you how much this was important to me. This is my recreation of some of the drawings. I mean, look at this thing. That, that looks terrible. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. That's supposed to be seed as the sea monster, but it looks kind of like a potato with teeth or... I, I, I actually think, there I say, it's like, here, it could best be described charitably as a potato with Mick Jagger's lips. Let's be honest, it kind of looks like a turd, right? Yeah. And then, a little bit later, I got introduced to comics. So, 
I read Greek mythology, and I literally was a kid. My family was really good. We went to the library every week, and we would just take stacks of books out, and we would take the same books over and over again. Eventually, we would maybe buy that one if we really loved it. I read every single thing of Greek mythology was age appropriate. There were some books just beyond my level, but I started branching out to other mythologies. So when I was about sixth grade, I was in the midst of my Norse mythology thing. Both of my parents liked comics. They were early, it was, actually it wasn't early, they were, just, they were young when they had me, and they still had a lot of like the youthfulness about them. They would draw with me, they would play with me, and they would still read comics. I grew up in a house where there was a lot of Hulk and Spider-Man and Conan, and uh, my mom was like really into Superman and like uh, Jimmy Olsen and stuff. So I'd read all these comics, and they weren't necessarily my favorites, but I loved them. But like none of them clicked with me, but in sixth grade, my mom came home and brought me an issue of Thor. I think the next slide is Thor. Nope, I put another thing in here to talk about. Uh, and that really clicked for me. I'll talk about that in a second. First, I'm gonna take an amusing diversion for you. Does anybody know who this character is? He, it's really funny talking about this right now because he is about to be insanely famous. He's Namor the Submariner. He is the first Marvel comics book character. He's going to be one of the main characters in the new Black Panther power, like movie. And it's very interesting because he's literally the first character that Marvel ever had. And he's just not that well known yet. He's my favorite character of all. I'll talk about him a little bit. So this is the first issue of Marvel Comics. This is where it all comes from. And there's a really fun story I like to share about like how right from the beginning, comics were always very much entwined with mythology. Um, so Superman, this, the year that this came out was 1940. Superman had come out like maybe a year before, and he was an immediate hit. He was across town at National Periodicals, now known as DC Comics. And the way people would describe him back then, because the whole concept of superhero was new, they would say he's like Hercules and Samson in a circus outfit. And so, and people couldn't quite figure out what made him so popular. A lot of characters came out that didn't work as well, tons. And every once in a while there'd be like a Batman that really did hit or something. And the man who owned the company that would eventually become Marvel Comics was named Martin Goodman. And Martin Goodman calls in a couple of his artists, one guy Carl Burgos, the other guy Bill Everett, into his office. And he's like, listen, across town, I don't know if you really sound like this, but he's gunning for my story. Across town, they got that Superman guy. He's like, Hercules in tights. Uh, make me something like that. So Carl Burgos creates the Human Torch, just a man on fire. And Bill Everett, who is the man who creates Namor the Submariner, is like, okay, so you're doing a fire guy. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to do a water guy. But he takes that little nugget about the idea of Superman being Hercules and Samson. He goes, this is in New York City, he goes to the Metropolitan Museum, and he goes to visit the Greek wing. He's like, I'll just go look at this stuff, see what I have as inspiration. And while he's there, he finds, well, that's Bill Everett. I just think that picture is cool. That dude looks cool, right? <laughs> he's like, look at me with my pipe. I mean, don't smoke, kids. Pipes are bad. But like, he's got the pipe, and he's, like, he's looking all jaunty. It's like, yeah. So he goes to the museum, and he sees, this isn't the actual statue, but he sees a Roman copy of a statue of Hermes. And he just basically takes the name Namor, which is Roman backwards. And this is what the character he creates looks like. It's just, it's just a Hermes. So like, and like so many of these superheroes have this element where like the Flash is just Hermes. Like they all have these, these mythological precedents and it's just super interesting to me the way this comes out. This is just a little diversion I threw in there just to give a little comics history. Don't worry, I'm returning to me. Uh, here is Thor. Like I said, when I was in sixth grade, my mom got me this Thor comic and the guy who was doing Thor at the time was a man named Walt Simonson. He wrote and drew the book, which is a huge influence to me as somebody who writes and draws my stuff. A lot of comics traditionally have been teams. He was a dude who did the whole thing. I'm like, I wanna do that when I get older. And he was telling the myths in ways, the stories that were very mythologically accurate. If you know your Norse mythology, Marvel Comics Thor is very off. Loki's not his brother. Like, you know, in mythology, Loki's like kind of his uncle. It's very different. But this guy brought it much closer, and he did like stories like Ragnarok. This is Thor fighting Jormungandr, the world serpent. And this stuff blew my mind as a kid. And I started making, for the first time, my own real proper comics. This is something I drew in about sixth grade. Because of what I was reading, it's basically superhero Vikings. Because this is what, and, and look, that guy's just Skeletor. I'm just ripping off stuff left and right. Uh, Little kids might not even understand this. See the type here? I actually had to type this out on a typewriter and print it out and glue it on because we didn't even have a computer. 
So here's some pages of this. You know, it can see elements of things. It's, it's kind of goofy humored if you stop and read it, which is something I've never been able to shake. I've been very influenced by comic strips as well, and there's always a silliness to my stuff. And I kept getting better. This is something I did years later. This is either high school or college. And I'm drawing stuff to try selling work to Marvel and DC, which were the big comic publishers at the time, because comics hadn't filled out the way they are now. And that was kind of it. You could either draw comic strips or the newspapers, or you could draw superhero comics. So you could see this giant sea monster here coming up, and it revealed, oh, there's that guy Namor again. We're going to come back to this again in a little bit. And time passes. I never quite worked for Marvel. I actually break in doing kids' books first, which I'm really glad I did because it's a much better business model. And uh, I start doing the Olympian series. All this stuff, all the stuff in my head comes swirling out. All this myth, all this comics, all this stuff. And it's the impetus for me to create the 12 book series. Just finished it, kind of. Although I'm, I'm officially in record saying this to several sources now, so you might as well hear it. This could be a secret 13th book called The Mystery of Demeter. Um, we'll talk about that later, maybe. But it's been interesting. This is me working out something for my entire life that has been the driving creative influence. My favorite thing to read about, coming out 12 books, basically one a year for 12 years, and using it as a method to like travel around and talk to people and communicate. Like I was talking with like young fans here. Like, like I, I'm not kidding when I say kids are almost the only people who can actually discuss this on the same level as I. We get super geeky about it. And we're like, who would in a fight, Ares or Apollo? I'm like, Ares would kick Apollo's butt and all that stuff. But what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about some of the process of how these books are made, maybe share some of my favorite myths, share some other stuff like that. This is a drawing from 2008. Basically, I had the idea to do the Olympian series. Uh, I wanted it to be 12 books, which is very interesting to try to convince your publisher to commit to 12 books. That's a lot of money for them. And, but I was able to convince them to do it, luckily. And this was the first sketch I did with plans for the first four books. And it was pretty audacious. We had a lot of meetings. I convinced them I knew what I was doing. And we started working on the actual series. This is a little bit hard to see, but that's by design. So the way I work, and if you've gotten a book signed by BUC, I draw very, very quickly. I like to treat drawing almost like it's my handwriting. I like to draw, and it's for me, and those of you, almost all of you put your hands up for drawing, so I think I could get a little bit more you know, molecular this. For me, drawing is very performative. And the way I feel about a piece often depends on how I feel drawing it. And one of the things I do when I am drawing for publication, well, before I get too much further, how many of you have ever had the experience of like looking at a picture in a book and being like, I can never draw it in a million years, no way, no how? There should be literally everyone here unless you've somehow never seen a book or you're secretly the world's greatest artist. So I have that thing too. And something a lot of people don't realize is you're comparing to a final project when, uh, or final product. When I'm drawing, I'm drawing very, very quickly and I'm making tons of mistakes and I don't erase. I basically will draw until I can't continue anymore. So this is the actual pencils to the cover of my first book in the series, Zeus, but it's not the first time I drew it. The first one, he only came up to about there. And I could have erased it and redrew it, but then the page would have been all chewed up and it would have just made me feel bad because, again, that performative aspect. So instead, I take the entire piece off when I realize I made my mistake, put it there in the drawing board next to it, look at it, and then draw again. Second version I drew the cover, he was the right size now, but he was at the wrong angle. You could actually see up his mini skirt, which made it very inappropriate. So we took that one off. And I'm surrounded now by these two versions that didn't work. Third version just looked weird. And it's maybe it's just because I was feeling bad about it. We've all had this experience. You draw something, you don't know why it doesn't work, but it's not working. I'm like, that just looks weird. So now I'm surrounded by three versions that didn't work, like tiny Zeus, inappropriate Zeus, weird Zeus. And I draw this one, and I finish this one, which is a good sign. Probably takes me about maybe 45 minutes. I also draw big, because then everything shrinks down, looks tighter, and looks better. That's, that's a good one to remember. And there's still a lot of mistakes, but I was I'm like, I can make this work. Like, his sickle is a weird, this is Kronos the Titan, his sickle's a weird blob. He only has three fingers and a thumb in that hand. Zeus has this weird line electrocuting his nipple, which really probably shouldn't be there. And his front leg looks like a chicken leg bone. But these are little things. So then I take my pen and my ink, and I trace over just the lines I want to be there. Then it looks like somebody I couldn't draw in a million years, even though I did. And I'm able to slowly fix those little problems. 
So, you know, smooth sickle, no more electrocuted nipple, no more chicken leg bone. But you all see it, right? Still three fingers and a thumb. I like to point this out just because... Actually, it hasn't really been a problem here, but a lot of places when I travel around, when I ask rooms full of people, if I ask a group full of like elementary school kids who likes their jaw, nearly everyone puts their hand up. I get into middle grade, it gets sparser and sparser until by eighth grade, you literally see sometimes them look to the cool kids to see if it's okay to put their hands up. High school, this happens a lot. We're like, who likes to draw here? And they'll be like, that's the one, she's the one who draws. And you're like, ooh. <laughs> and that person's like, don't look at me. And I kid you not, I have asked this, I'll be like talking to a room full of teachers, I ask this question and they just kind of blink and look at me. Because they don't, it's like a rhetoric question, they don't think they should answer it. This has been very different here, which I'm very excited. Like everywhere I've spoken in this area, like people have been like, yeah, I like to draw, so y'all are cool. But I have this theory, actually it doesn't mean, it's not cool, I mean you're not uncool if you don't draw anymore, because I have this theory. I think the reason why most people stop drawing around eighth grade, and it's not just drawing, it's a lot of stuff, it's because at that point you're getting good at whatever it is that you love to do, but you also become, like, let's be honest, eighth grade's a rough time for everybody, right? There's probably not a single person here who didn't like, you know, junior high stinks. Because you're growing, you're becoming yourself, peer pressure is terrible, and it becomes a time you become very self-conscious, and a lot of people become afraid of screwing up at that point. And I know I was one of them. So I think a lot of people just stop doing those things they love doing. They draw, stop drawing, they stop playing sports, dance, music, art, whatever it was that they did, you see a real drop off right at the eighth grade mark. So I like to, whenever I talk, I just always like to point this out that this is seriously one of the most important things I've ever drawn. The first book in my series, if you've ever seen anything of me, it's probably this. There's like, this is translated to other language, there's hundreds of thousands of copies of it in print, and they all have a huge mistake on the front cover. And I just love pointing that out. And there's always an apologist who's like, well, maybe the lightning bolt's in front of his finger. I'm like, no, it's not there. I have the original artwork. But this is my big lesson. I'm going to get into silly stuff after this, so don't worry. This is my last serious bit. Um, if you take away nothing else from here today, it's this. None of you are perfect, and none of you will ever do anything perfect, and that's beautiful. Because when you're not perfect, it means you always have room to get better. And there's something kind of bleak about the idea of being on top and never getting better. So like, it's the human condition. You're always striving to be better, to learn more. And that's kind of like, like that's just the best way to be, I think. All right, now we'll talk about silly stuff. Athena, Athena, is, well, this isn't silly. Athena is the smartest of the Greek gods, of course. She's also their greatest warrior. And this is an example of sometimes, this is a story I'm gonna show. It just shows how I'm able to pull in things from other parts of my life. This is the 1981 movie, Clash of the Titans. Have you all ever seen this? Uh, it's good. It's, it's, I loved it as a kid. I still love it, but there's definitely some problems with it. And as a kid, I was, like, I was a little guy who liked to know his stuff and correct people. And it drove me nuts. This is one of the big bads. So it's the story of Perseus. Perseus cuts off the head of Medusa. And then the big third act thing is he uses it to freeze this creature who terrorizes Andromeda. And in the movie, he's called the Kraken. And if you're like a little geek nerd like me, a geek geek, Greek geek, you're like, the Kraken is Norse. The Kraken's not. It was a creature called Cetus. And like, just picture like little six or seven or eight-year-old George, however old there was, being like, well, actually. And like, you know, the adults were like, yes, George. And this drove me nuts. I, I mean, it's cool. He looks great, right? But like, it just drove me nuts. And I would, every time this movie would come up, even though I loved it, I'm like, but you know, the Kraken's really Norse. They're like, yes, George, we know. So I've already talked about it. <laughs> it's the, the Cetus. This monster, it means, Cetus means whale-like, right? It means whale. Like, cetacean is our scientific term for whales. Like, people just aren't getting it right. Like, this turd with teeth is terrible. And this was in my favorite book. I'm like, this isn't working either. So when it came time for me to draw Cetus, I kind of went back to, like, old sources. And, you know, like, Greek vase paintings are always a great source for inspiration. I don't know if this really looks like a whale as much as, like, a dog shark or something, but it's cool, right? It actually has a sense of menace that that doesn't. <laughs> Although, I guess if I was in the water and that came near me, I would lose it. It's like, ah, a giant mud slug. Um, then there was this one. Now, this one I really liked. I liked the way that the whale had kind of like these piggy features. Like, we've all seen those old carvings, like those old wood carvings of like, you know, here there be monsters and maps. They would draw like these kind of like pig-like whales. I'm like, that's really cool. And then I remembered, because never let anything go to waste, everybody. 
I'd actually drawn something like that once before. If you remember, this was actually from my, uh, my Marvel sample I showed you earlier. I had designed a creature, a sea monster, based on those ideas, like a whale monster, but had like those kind of elements. I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna use that again. So I was actually able to recycle this thing from this really old drawing I'd done, like it was like 20, 30 years old maybe, and bring it into my Olympian series. And now it was a proper whale monster, not a kraken or a potato with teeth. Hera. A lot of people are surprised when I say this. Actually, it happens a lot less nowadays, I'm happy to hear. Uh, Hera is my favorite goddess. And they're always kind of like, wait, why do you like Hera? She's so mean to Zeus and his thousands of girlfriends. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> it seems like it's, I've talked about, I talk about this a lot, so much so I don't want to get into it too much, but I feel like we very unfairly victimize the character of Hera. She's like, she is super powerful. She is Zeus's equal or superior in every way, and she gets this bad rep over the years because Zeus cheats on her like every 30 seconds or so. So what I'm going to do now, the other reason I really like this book, I'll go back, I want to say one thing about me, because me, me, me. Uh, this was the book I felt like I grew the most as a writer. Like, doing what I do, words and pictures working together, I was always more confident in the drawing part of things than the word part of things. And this was the book where I had aspirations of how to make this work, of how to bring forth the idea of the character of Hera as I saw her. And I didn't honestly know if I was talented enough. And I already had a publishing contract for it, so it was very scary. And I think I did it. And so if you will all indulge me, I'm going to do a dramatic reading of a scene from my book, Hera. Reading comics aloud stinks if you've ever had to do it. The way I'm going to do it is the best way, where it's going to be like almost a pan, panel by panel. Because comics, like I said, super collaborative. If you look at the page all at once, you'll get ahead of me. So <clears throat> setting the scene. Hera is looking for Zeus, because Zeus is not around as usual. So she goes around Olympus, asking the other gods. They're all acting super shifty and dodgy. And she's like, oh, I know what this is again. So she levitates down to Earth. That's why she's kind of hopping there. She's just come down. Zeus, are you here? You can come out now. And then off of the bushes, oh no, it's her. Quick, hide. Her? Her who? Hera? Hide where? Here you are, having a picnic with a cow. Hera, I can explain. Now you can't really see there too, there's very ever so slightly a little bit of sparkles there. Something just happened. This cow was maybe not a cow two seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, I know you guys know this story. Well, this should be good. Yeah, well, you see, um, she's a gift for you. For me? Zeus, I can't remember the last time you got me a gift. Let's get a look at you. I just want to, everyone, just keep an eye on, the, on Zeus throughout this and his increasing state of dismay as the story progresses. And a cow. Whatever made you think to get me such a romantic gift? Um, it's uh, because she has such beautiful eyes. They remind me of your eyes. Did you hear that? Cow-eyed. I have a very flattering husband. But you're right. She is a very beautiful cow, Zeus. That must be why you were having a picnic with her. As an aside, in ancient Greece, one of the titles that she was called was boopsis, which means cow-eyed, boopsis, actually. So this actually is like kind of a nerdy in-joke thing. Now it's funnier because you heard that, right? And I shall take her and put garlands on her horns and sing her praises. Wouldn't that be lovely, dear? And now Zeus is like, I'm in trouble. You know, uh, on second thought, I I've seen more beautiful cows. Let me go get you another one. More beautiful? But you said that this cow had eyes as beautiful as mine. Uh, are you saying that you've seen cows with eyes more beautiful than mine? Well, I, yes or no, Zeus, you can't have it both ways. Have you or have you not seen cows with eyes more beautiful than mine? No, no, of course not. Even this cow's eyes are not so beautiful as yours. I merely meant her eyes. Her eyes had a shade of something that reminded me of yours. And now, of course, I see it's just a reflection of the sky. The same beautiful blue as the color of your eyes. Pause. She knows what she's, she's got him wriggling like a fish on a hook. That's better. Very well, Zeus. I accept your very thoughtful 
Very romantic gift. Look at the cow. The cow's like, I'm dead. Um, where, where are you taking her? Oh, someplace safe. Someplace where she will be under guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for all time. A cow as lovely as this, it would be a shame if she were to be stolen. By the way, what is her name? And now Zeus is defeated. Oh. Io. It's Io. Io. A lovely name for a lovely cow. Now, I think most of us know the story of Io, right? Like the basics of it. Zeus turned her into a cow. She wanders about. It actually weaves back into a series of stuff. This was something I tried to do with Olympians, to take like these kind of stories, these big stories that exist out in the world, and give them a little bit more of a human spin. One of the things I think that makes Greek mythology so entertaining and relevant after all this time is the fact that the Greek gods are an abstraction of an actual family. Most of us come from big, crazy families, or even small, crazy families, and you can see elements of the way they behave. Normally, I would say a guy who is a serial cheater on his wife isn't very funny, but there's a way to do this in a way that shows that Hera actually is in control of the situation. She, Zeus is what Zeus is, but she's the one who's completely threading him through the loop this entire time. Now, this is the cover of my fourth book, Hades, Lord of the Dead. A lot to say about Hades. Uh, Hades was originally going to be called Demeter, Goddess of Grain, and my publisher's like, change it to Lord of the Dead, it's going to sell better. And they were probably right. This was the first time one of my books hit the bestseller list in the series. And it pulled the rest of them on with it. So I have to say they were probably right in that. But this is why I want to go back and do a Demeter book, because she's the Olympian here. Hades isn't Olympian. He doesn't live on Olympus. He shouldn't be there. And I'm not really going to talk about this one, because it's literally the most famous myth of all. I'm showing you this picture because I think the horses came out really good. <laughs> it's hard to draw horses, man. Their legs bend all weird. They got all them weird faces. <clears throat> And that brings it to Poseidon. You'll notice now the books forever after will all say New York Times bestselling author. Well, this one it says of Hades. Eventually, we just change the other ones. Uh, Poseidon, very, very popular thanks to Rick Riordan these days. Uh, here's my take on Poseidon. I try to bring a relatability to the gods because I see this in these stories. And I try to like, think about the way that we can feel closer to these beings. Poseidon is the middle child of the big three brothers. Hades is the oldest. Poseidon's the middle Zeus is the baby. So how many of you are siblings? How many of you are old? How many of you have younger siblings? OK. Can you imagine the absolute horror of having like your younger sibling be in charge of you? Like, I'm the oldest of six. And if anyone, there was ever even one instance where one of my siblings had any power over me, it would be the end of the world. And that really influences my version of Poseidon. <laughs> He's, if you read the stories, he's all over the place. He's like this raging god monster. And I think that's part of the reason why. Like his little brother tells him what to do. I'd be like, oh, no, I'm sinking Atlantis. <laughs> Aphrodite. Um, this was actually maybe my most, people ask me a lot, like, what's your favorite book? What's your most fun book to draw? This one was the most fun. It came to me very easily. Sometimes I have to really struggle, redraw things over and over again. I had a vision for this one. It came up very clearly. Aphrodite is a very fascinating character to me. She is the self-made goddess. She literally creates herself out of sea foam and the power of love. She wasn't even a she before that. She, in my opinion, is the most powerful of the gods because she has the power to bring relationships together and sunder them. Like you see Zeus, who normally sees a beautiful face. He's like, hey, here's my number. He has his back turned. He immediately recognizes the threat that she is to him. And the one thing that was a little tricky in doing the Aphrodite book was designing Aphrodite herself. I wanted her to look different than the Olympians because she marries into the family. She's not blood. But I also had to make her incomparably beautiful. And beauty is a hard thing to quantify. It's, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. And so I worked and worked with this. And I finally was like, OK, the way to make this work, I think I have another slide. Here's her moment of birth when she comes out into the world. And everyone sees her for the first time. But how do I get to this point? Well, I'll tell you. I, I, choke, I took a little bit from Botticelli's Venus. I think we've all seen that painting. Very famous, but I wanted to have a little bit more something that spoke to the way people look today, the ideas of beauty today. So I took the two most, this is not something I tell a lot of people, so you're getting the, the inside scoop. I took the two most beautiful women I could think of. I took Sofia Vergara from Modern Family and Beyonce <laughs> and combined them. And that was my, like literally on my drawing board, there was those photos and that. And that's how I came up with my Aphrodite. 
Aphrodite, like I said, most powerful, has everything going for her. The one thing she doesn't have going for her, terrible taste in men. The way, here's a good clue. I don't know how many of you are of dating age. Some of you certainly look like you are. I don't want to, you know, assume. Uh, if you ever, like, get, like, you know, you're dating someone and like, you see their profile pic and it's them standing on a pile of dead people, that's a clue. Don't date them. And if they go to pick you up on their ride and they're in a chariot covered with horse blades, that's bad news, too. Aries and the next god I'm going to talk about, I placed in the middle of the series because I didn't have much affinity for them. They were the two who I felt like I had the least in common with. Or I, I just couldn't feel the character beats for them. What I came upon in the Aries book by reading lots of original sources, there's a recurrent theme in Aries myths. So recurrent, I couldn't tell them all because they become very monotonous, where Aries goes to the nth degree to protect his children, his mortal children specifically. Most of the gods don't care. And Ares will routinely risk banishment or worse to, to avenge or save a child, particularly if it's another god who did something to his kid. And I found that was to be such an interesting thing. I kind of hung this book on the idea of Ares being an actually good dad who doesn't express himself right. I think we all know this sort of dad, but who has the love in his heart. And the way he shows it is he overcompensates in toxic masculinity. But... Um, <laughs> As bad as he is, and this is literally a picture of a dude riding over a group of people in a spiked chariot, standing on top of a pile of dead people, he doesn't, this guy gets my vote for the worst of the gods. However, I'm going to say this because I, both of them I actually have great affinity for, especially Apollo. After writing Apollo's book, he became my favorites. But this is why I think Apollo is the grand creep. Apollo, a lot of people think of him as the god of the sun, and he was, but that was like later antiquity. For most of the period where he was worshipped, he was the god of like music and poetry and song and young men coming together in the civic ideas, all these things that are kind of like laudable, but his myths make him the biggest creep in the world. So do you, do you all know the story of Marsyas? <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you this one really quick because it's messed up. So this dude is Marsyas. He is a satyr, half man, half goat, all party. He has been wandering through the woods with Dionysus and his retinue, and he finds this type of musical instrument called an ulos. It's like two horns, like almost like, it looks like two clarinets that join up at the top. It's two horns. He's playing it. Sounds great. Everyone's digging it. They're dancing, partying, having a good time. And please understand, he has no reason to think Apollo is anywhere nearby when he says this. But just apropos of nothing, because he's feeling really good, he's a little bit high in his own supply, he's like, man, I am playing really good tonight. I bet even Apollo himself couldn't play any better. And bam, like Apollo teleports down from Mount Olympus. He's like, so you think you're better than me, huh? I'm the god of music. You think you could play better than me? Let's have a competition. I'm an Olympian. I could grant you anything. If you win, if you beat me in music competition, I'll grant you any wish you want. Marsyas thinks about it a little bit. Dionysus plays a little bit of a devil's advocate. Like, go on, do it. What's the worst that could happen? Go on, do it, do it. I'm not drunk. Do it. And, <laughs> and Marsyas is like, you're on. They have a competition. Word of advice, evergreen advice. If you ever have an opportunity to have a competition, musical or otherwise, with a god, don't do it. They are gods. They can warp reality. They'll do whatever they want to win. He doesn't have to warp reality. He's the god of music. Of course he plays better. His singing brings everyone there, stops them dead in their tracks. He kills the party, makes them all bummed out. They're all crying, but they all agree it's better. And Marsyas realizes it. He's like, wow. And he goes up to Apollo and he's like, hey, uh, I'm sorry. I said I was as good as you. I didn't mean to offend you. I'm just, you're the better musician. And there's a beat and he realizes, but you know, you said you would grant me a wish of anything I wanted if I won. What do you want if you win? And Paolo just kind of leans back, smiles, pulls a boning knife out of nowhere, and he's like, not much, just your skin. And he skins him alive. Like, <laughs> it's just, that's messed up, right? Like, Ares is bad news of giving him a battlefield, but he's not going to go out of his way to skin you alive for insulting him. Like, Apollo is kind of like this, he's kind of terrifying. And it's, I do love this part about him. The thing about Apollo is my take on him, he's insecure. He was tormented since before he was even born. He's an illegitimate child of Zeus, as many of the gods are. He and his sister Artemis were hounded. Their mother, Leto, she couldn't give birth to them 
for years. She was pregnant with twins, and Hera withheld the grace to let her give birth. So this woman was chased over the surface of the planet by different creatures and Aries and all this stuff. And finally, when they were born, they were practically like, like exiles. And so Apollo is always trying to overcompensate. Whereas Artemis, she's there, she comes out first. Are we have any twins in the audience? Are you the oldest? So you're in charge, right? Same thing as her. She literally had to be born and age herself up using her godly powers and serve as the midwife for Apollo because Apollo's like, I don't want to go outside. It's nice in here. She's like, get out of here. And <laughs> she's one of my favorite characters, one of my favorite gods. She is the protector of women. She is the protector of children, goddess of childbirth for obvious reasons because she got denied, even though she never has kids of her own. And she is the protector of wild creatures. Well, she also hunts them too. And the moment I chose to show in her story, oh, wrong way. That's so interesting to me is there's a myth where the first time she meets her father, it's been a couple of years, at least for gods, they age inconsistently. It's hard to tell, but she's a little girl at this point. And she meets Zeus for the first time, the world's, you know, the absent father. And he's like, so what do you want? What can I give you? You're my daughter. I want to give you anything. And Artemis, as this little child, has her whole life planned out. She's like, okay, I want uh, a bow and arrow from the Cyclopes that will never miss, and I want a bunch of Oceanides to run through and be my hunting attendants. I want the nymphs to be my personal attendants. I want a whole bunch of hunting dogs to help me hunt prey, and I want this chariot to let me go through the woods and all this stuff. And most importantly, I never want to marry. I never want to be tied down. And this is because I thought that was interesting because like, she has the world's worst father. Like, <laughs> Well, he's not a bad father. He's a bad husband. So you see that, and she like... Her whole thing, Artemis decides that she is this self-defining goddess. She makes this vow that she will be single and be free for her entire life. And what's so interesting about her myths, you see this over and over again, there's always stories where she's almost tempted. There's a, lot, a recurring theme where there's, like, there's a, a guy or a girl that she's kind of into, but her vow is so important to her. Like The vow is everything to Artemis, and it's this constant struggle. And I chose this image to show you because I just like the way I drew her with a gap in her teeth. I think it's cute. And then this game brings us up to Hermes. Hermes, like I said, he was my fave, and I didn't really know which one to talk about him. His myths are kind of all over the place. He's the one of the most versatile of the characters. Like, my favorite myths probably are the stories from the Homeric hymn of Hermes, where he's a little baby. He's one day old, and he's born, and he's already a super genius. And he's so smart, he knows not to let anybody else know this. So he goes around and sneaks out at night and starts pranking Apollo. And Apollo is losing his mind. And the other gods are all like really amused, like Apollo's nuts, because Apollo's like, this baby's stealing all my stuff. And this is, <laughs> and it's a really fun story, but I'm like, you know what? I'll let you read it in the book instead. And then there's another story, the story in here of Typhon. Typhon is the ultimate monster of Greek mythology. He was the last son of Mother Earth. 100 heads, each head was a different creature. They all spoke different languages. They all vomited poison and breathed fire. His body was so big it filled the sky and he had wings that scraped the stars. For a sense of scale, that's Mount Olympus. And this is only like, oh, skipped ahead, oops. Oh, going the wrong way, guys. This is only like maybe an 11th or 12th of him. Dude's big, but instead, Tying into the theme of my entire purpose here, at last, my confession is having root. I'm going to tell you the myth that I taught Madeline Miller myself. She did not know this story until she read it in my book. Now, you will all know what we know. This is a really dumb story, too. Does anybody know this one? It's amazing. You'll, you'll get what it's about as I go. Many years ago, dogs lived a life of subjugation to mankind. They lived in squalor and had no agency of their own. More importantly, most importantly, they never got enough food from their masters to satisfy their hunger. If anyone has a dog, you know all that's true. Like, dog will never eat enough. Uh, so squalor, that's their own problem. They, they do that. The dogs raised their voices to the heavens and howled their lament. Passing by one of his many travels, Hermes heard their prayers and took pity on the dogs in their plight. Hermes arranged for the dogs to have an audience with his father, Zeus, king of the gods, to plead their case. The king of the dogs appointed three of the finest examples of dog kind to serve as the emissaries to Zeus. I just want to interrupt really quickly. Uh, that was my sister's dog, Bronte. He's since passed. That was my uncle's dog, Pugsley. And that's my mom's dog, Zeus. <laughs> the arranged for time arrived, but the dog ambassadors are nowhere to be found. Someone has got to invent a timepiece. 
For they, being dogs, had little conception of time and had delayed to sate their hunger on refuse. It's a fancy way of saying eat garbage. Hermes found the missing dog envoys and escorted them to Mount Olympus, home of the gods. They waited for Zeus to make his appearance. Look at dumb Zeus in that picture, the dog. Which he did, thunderously. Overcome with awe, the dogs, they, well, they voided their bowels all over Mount Olympus. And I did mention they've been eating garbage, right? <laughs> Zeus was understandably livid. Silver-tongued Hermes was able to calm him down, and he got Zeus to agree to a second meeting with the dogs. Hermes expressed his displeasure to the king of the dogs. They were bad, bad dogs. <laughs> the king of the dogs thought hard on how to avoid a repeat of the last malodorous performance. A dog is a dog is a dog, after all. And a dog's going to eat garbage no matter what. The king of the dogs had his dog ambassadors drink many bottles of perfume in advance of the meeting. <laughs> they arrived early and waited patiently for Zeus to receive them. As is his wont, Zeus materialized with a clap of thunder. And the dogs, well, as truly awful as the smell had been last time, it turns out when you mix perfume with poop, it becomes tragically, exponentially, unbelievably worse. The earth shook, the heavens trembled, as Zeus, king of the gods, vented his rage. A good king does not prevent ambassadors from safely leaving his kingdom. But this aggression will not stand. Hear this, O oh dogs of earth, because of the acts of these incontinent incompetents. Forevermore you will live under the heel of mankind with no agency of your own. You will live in squalor and never, ever have enough food to satisfy your appetites. Dogkind heard human, Zeus's proclamation and were, to put it mildly, infuriated with the ambassadors. And this is the payoff. You all ready for it? Since then, dogs everywhere have been searching for the asinine canines who cost them their one shot at a better existence, which is why, to this day, whenever two dogs meet, they immediately sniff each other's behinds to see if they smell of perfume. Isn't that story ridiculous? I love that the ancient Greeks are like, we need to come up with a myth to explain that behavior. So yeah, um, here it is. This is the photo. This is, this is me, and there's Madeline Miller, who wrote Circe, Stephen Saylor in the middle. Uh, this is us at a, a classics conference in New York. I think this is 2017, but it might be 2019. It's 2000 something before the pandemic, and who knows what those dates mean anymore. And we were on a panel together, and she was like, I'd never heard that story before. And I'm like, I'm going to write that on my tombstone. So in case you're wondering, it's actually an Aesop's fable. Uh, the dude who was talking in the story, I didn't introduce him. He's Aesop. He's telling the story. Uh, Hermes, fun fact, is, appears in more uh, Aesop's fables than any other Greek god because he is the god of fables and storytelling and trickery. So it all makes sense he'd be there. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up really quick because I've been talking a long time at you all. So there's Hephaestus. Uh, he's one of my favorites. Um, he's one of two gods of fire for the ancient Greeks. He's like the god of like volcanoes, but he's also the god of like creation. He's like the artist of the Greeks, uh, the Greek gods. He's also like the sweetest of them, which means he gets picked on a lot. And the moment I chose to show you here is the, this is pretty rough. He's about to erupt. He's had it up to here. He literally just discovered that his brother is having an affair with his wife. And he's just like... It's too much. The sweetest God has just been kicked the entire book. And instead of reacting in violence, instead of erupting like the volcano that is his namesake, he's actually crafting, you really can barely see it, a chain. It's one molecule thick. It's of, of metal, of a substance called adamantine. Do you all know Wolverine from the X-Men? This is where adamantium comes from. It's unbreakable. He makes this chain into a net, which he uses to capture his wife and husband in the, and brother in the act and disgraces him. That's kind of his revenge. Instead of just beating him up. But then he does, in case you're wondering, he definitely beats up his brother later, so don't worry. And then the book that just, the last book in the series for now. This one, the most recent to come out. Um, you all seem like you're a pretty creative group. So I feel like there's probably, you've all had this experience when you've made something and you know you're happy with it, but when you look at it, you really can't figure out what you feel about it for the most part. And some days you might like it, and some days you don't. Like, this is kind of how I feel about this book. It's a little bit too recent for me. So 
I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to explain a little bit how the sausage gets made, how an Olympian's book gets done. Oh, there's, <laughs> this is the moment I finished the books. I just gotten in the mail, the 12th book, I put it on the shelf, I'm like, that's the end of me. Like, it, was, it felt very weird. First thing, I knew I wanted to have this book be narrated by Hestia. If you know Greek mythology, you may know Hestia, you might not, because she's kind of the forgotten Olympian. She's the first Olympian. She's Zeus's big, big sister. She is, as you might guess, a goddess of fire. She was the goddess of fire of the hearth. And something I always like to point out to people, people nowadays being the goddess of the fireplace, wouldn't be that impressive. But in the time period that she existed in, that she was this most important goddess, the hearth was the centerpiece of your life. It's what gave you light at night. It kept away the predators. It gave you warmth. It's where you cooked your food. You sat around as a family and told stories of the gods. She was so central. And weirdly, she doesn't have very many temples because you viewed her as part of your life, like none of the other gods. Maybe only Hermes was somebody you actually interacted with on this level, if you believed in them. You would give a little first part of every meal, just throw it into the fireplace for her. In Athens, it was actually a law in the books. You had to say a prayer to her at other gods' festivals before anyone else because she was so important. And she appears in literally maybe three myths. And one of them is totally inappropriate. I can never put it in one of these books. And it's very interesting to me that this character, this goddess who was so important that they made laws about her importance, never appears in myths. And my theory is the stories, kind of like the whole theme I'm getting to, it's about humanizing the gods bringing them down, making them kind of look like jerks a lot, right? I don't think they wanted to tell stories about her where she ever looked bad, so she just doesn't appear much in the mythological record. But as such an important being, she had to get her due, so I made her the narrator of this book. She's the first god telling the story, well, the first Olympian, I should say, telling the story of the last Olympian, Dionysus. So I've kind of alluded to this. I am a big fan of research. I'm, a pretty, uh, I'm pretty good at making up stuff on the fly. I'm pretty quick with that stuff, but I'm not gonna be as creative as every single person who ever lived before me. I give myself at least a few months before doing one of these books to read every single original source I could find. I am not able to read ancient Greeks or rely on translations. That means I will read multiple translations of the same stories to capture as much of the flavor as I can. And I just keep reading and reading and reading until my head is swimming with ideas. And the entire time, if you look here, I have a little sketchbook open to me. If you catch me at any point, I'm never more than like maybe 15 feet away from my sketchbook. It's almost like my security blanket. I bring with me everywhere I go because sometimes I get an idea, sometimes I want to draw. I do all my thinking in this, and I treat it as a sketchbook. It's not a perfect work of art book. Some of the stuff that's in here looks good, some of it's garbage, some of it never gets finished. And I will just draw. I will draw the character the book is gonna be about hundreds of times from every single angle and every single pose I could think of. I will draw them doing things they'll probably do in the book. I'll draw them doing things they definitely won't do in the book. I remember I was drawing Dionysus surfing. You know what, Dionysus never surfed. But I just draw these things until they become almost like a three-dimensional image in my head where I could picture them doing stuff and they start reacting like people I maybe know. And I bring in elements of people I know to, be, to kind of fill in these pieces in the character. And then I start writing. This isn't much to look at. It's a couple sketchy drawings and some words. This is how I write. As I said up front, comics are words and pictures coming together to tell a story. Everyone does it different. You can speak to every graphic novel to have a different idea. This is the way I work. I don't like to write a full script because then I don't think I'm using that one pillar of artwork to tell the story the way I could because then it's almost illustrating what I already wrote. And I can't draw it before I know what the story is because then it just kind of wanders off. I do both simultaneously. And basically, if it's an idea that I, I think of in words, it comes to me in words, I put it in words. If it's an idea that I can express better as a picture, I draw it that way. And I'll just go through, oops, I'll just keep doing this, keep refining. It's a process that can sometimes take months, where more and more writing comes sometimes, and they start forming into panels. There starts being a composition to the page. It gets more and more. And then at this point, you're like, I, can almost, I can't tell what you're drawing, George, but I can almost see how that looks like a comics page. At this point, I have a pretty clear idea of what the story is going to be. I know it. Nobody else can see it. So then, oh, this is actually important to mention. It's very easy to just kind of get in the weeds and just travel out and not really keep your pacing. I make a little graph of like how long the book will be and how much longer I should spend on each section. And this all helps me get this together. It's a process that takes so many revisions that I can't even count them. Then I take all those words I wrote and I assemble them into a script. 
and I take all those pictures I drew, and I make them into something somebody else can interpret. You could look at this and more or less see what's happening. This is how my editors read my books for the first time. It's two separate documents, side by side. They read it, and they were able to comment. They're able, this part's not clear. You go too long here. You misspelled this word 18 times here, all those things like that. Then I start working on the finished artwork. Just like that Zeus cover I showed you, it is very common for me to start a page, get partially through, and realize I don't like it. I'm actually, I've been looking at this one recently because I've been presenting a lot. I'm really not sure what it was about made me hate this one. But something about this, I'm like, it's not working. I stopped about midway through, and then I drew this one. I'm going to toggle back and forth. You can see it's the same basic layouts, but there's differences. This one works better. I finished. That's always a good sign. Once I finish it, I scan it in. I clean up the artwork. I add in the panel borders and such. Add my first pass of coloring. Then I'll go in and add my second pass of coloring and special effects and gradients and things like that. And this is actually the last step I do. I've already worked out where all the word bubbles go and everything. I've already figured this much out. The one thing I don't do in doing Olympian's book is actually drop the text in, because I find that to be boring. So I make some of my publisher do that. They drop in the text. And then, nine months later, the book comes back to me, and I celebrate. I'm glad you all laughed, because like, I can't even tell you how often I show this and nobody laughs. I'm like, oh, I chose this as a funny photo on purpose. But you all just, that's just what I look like. That's <laughs> Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, I wonder if, I do have a few moments still, right? Would you like to see a little bit of what I'm working on now? Okay. So I'm taking a break from Greek stuff for now. Uh, 12 books in 12 years was a lot. I do intend to come back. Like I said, there'll be the mystery of Demeter. And I also want to just do like books going on, stories that aren't Olympian-centric, telling other aspects of Greek mythology. It's an endlessly interesting and creative font. Like, it, it just comes to me. I learn so much about humanity and the world and everything by exploring it through this lens. And I want to keep sharing that. But I'm taking a four book series to do, <laughs> why does it say top secret? <laughs> I'm being very dramatic when I made this. Uh, I'm doing a book on Nor four books on Norse mythology. Uh, first book is already done. What you're looking at here is the first few pages of Odin, where you see a bunch of dead Vikings on the ground and there's like crows eating them. And then the, this, cra this like light opens up in the sky, like a rift, and these figures in silver come flying out on horses. It's the Valkyrior. And they land down, and they pick up the souls of these Vikings, and they carry them off into the sky to Valhalla, which uh, that was a lot to draw, boy. And inside Valhalla, if you don't know Valhalla, Valhalla is, this is super basic and not at all 100% accurate, Valhalla is like the blessed afterlife of the Vikings. This is what you aspired to if you were from that society. Um, you would go inside there. You could only get to Valhalla if you died in battle, which is key. And inside, all day, you are feasted. You drink this mead that comes from this special goat. You eat this pork, this delicious pork. And there's people like juggling knives and stuff. And you just party all night long, get super duper drunk and whatnot. And then at night, you kill each other. Like, this is their idea of, like, the heaven. This is the best afterlife. You, get, you, you party till you can't even stand up anymore, and then they all grab their swords and murder each other and their axes. And then it starts over again every day. So, yeah, the Vikings, fun people. And then this last picture here is just going to be uh, just a shot there of Odin on his throne, because I figure I should probably show him in that. And that's my presentation. <laughs> Thank you all for, oh yeah, I would love to take some questions. Thank you all, thank you again to the people at Hope College for bringing me out, especially with my, I think we can agree, tenuous connection to Madeline Miller. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? any questions? I'll be happy to take them. Yeah, uh, why do your pages traditionally when you could do them digitally nowadays? Uh, that's a good, so the question is, why do I do my pages traditionally when I could do them digitally these days? So um, for some books, I do draw digitally. I, I drew a book called Unrig entirely on my iPad. I used to draw a whole series for Simon Schuster called Captain Awesome, and I drew those digitally too. There is a feel that's different. Even if you take your iPad and put on like the paper sensitive sheens and stuff, there's a way. So I didn't actually mention this, I should have. When I ink, 
I actually, it's actually a bottle of ink, and I mix the ink together from two different inks I like to get the right consistency. And I have like these pens, they're called G-nibs, it's what manga artists use in Japan. And there's a way that these metal blades kind of lightly cut into the paper. There is a drag it creates. And again, that going back to the idea of performativeness, it feels better. There's something drawing digitally, there's always, to my feeling, gonna be a little, and I do draw digitally a lot, I draw digitally pretty much every day, and I draw my sketchbook, but they feel different. The one feels, drawing on my sketchbook, drawing on paper, there's a drag, there's, a, there's a, a physicality to do it that I don't get drawing digitally. And the big threat of digitally, it's not one that affects me, luckily, but I know, I actually could, I won't, I could mention names of artists whose career is destroyed. The power to control Z. Sometimes you just have to choose your line and just live with it. And there are people, there are professional cartoonists I, who you don't see anymore because they have gone to digital and they control Z, control Z, control Z. And their output goes from like a book every couple of years to a book never because they keep redrawing the same panel a million times. If you draw digitally, my advice to you would be limit, give yourself a strong limit how many times you do a control Z and also limit yourself on how much you will zoom in. That's another thing you see a lot because you can infinitely zoom in. People will zoom in like 500% and spend like an entire day drawing noodly little details, but then you get a very inconsistent page. I limit myself to like three zooms in as my top. <laughs> the problem with that is then is because then your art, you're seeing it not as the whole. You're seeing it in very... You zoom out, you zoom in, but like, it's just something to watch out for because there can be, and this is a problem I had, you might not have the problem, but you can have like a panel, I, in my book on rig you could see it actually, because it was the first long book, it was like 300 pages I drew digitally, there's definitely some pages where there's much more detail in like one panel, I'm like, oh, that doesn't look good. And that's such a way in comics, I should have mentioned this, you control the way a person's eye moves over the page in many ways, text placement, like the size of panels, but the amount of detail in a panel is an indicator of how long you want someone to linger on it. This, book, this panel is like super detailed, but if you look at some of my other stuff, there'll be pages where the characters are drawn much more sparingly, because I want you to, like, if this was like a movie, that would be just a shot really quick. And if I want you to linger on it, I go more detail. It gives you more, your eyes more to, like, to dissolve on, like to linger on. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the reason why, but I like both. They both have their, their, their purposes. Uh, when myths have like multiple different versions, how do you pick your favorite, the one that you're gonna draw? Oh, that's good, well, when myths have multiple different versions, how do I choose my favorite I'm gonna draw? That happens a lot. Cause there wasn't like, uh, like I mentioned with the, uh, when I was talking about Dolores up front, there, there wasn't like a, uh, a Bible. There's each region, each time period, all different versions. So I would place a little bit more importance on the work of Hesiod, do you know him? He wrote, the, he was a contemporary of Homer. He wrote something called the Theogony, which most of our understanding, the, if you've read a book and like they give you a history of the gods, he tends to be the one. So Hesiodic stuff I always gave a little bit more prominence to. Um, but besides from that, it would, it would sometimes be, I would pick and choose the parts that suited me best. If it was a myth that I'm like, this one really, if I feel like this character is this way, and this one particular myth really demonstrates that thing, I was gonna include that. If there was a myth that was maybe more famous but contradicted it, I did that with Hera a lot. There are myths where Hera is straight up hard to root for. And some of those I didn't include on purpose because I wanted to give Hera a chance. I want, so I'm like, well, I'm not gonna include that story where she like, you know, does that terrible thing. I can, actually can't think of any ones right now off the top of my head that I left out, but I know I did it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, when she kills, there's a version of the story where Hera actually makes Heracles go nuts and kill his family. And I'm like, that doesn't make anyone look good. And it just, it, 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 it's, it's almost like it gave like a, a, a narrative baggage and weight to the characters that I felt like neither Hera or Heracles could actually come out of that and not have it be something that just bogged them down. And so since I was able to find other versions of the story, which were actually older, I'm like, okay, so this was what was originally said about her, and in later antiquity, they kind of grafted this bit on where she was the monster. So I'm like, I'm gonna go back to the original sources where she's actually, she's not thrilled about him, but she actually helps him out, you know? 
Any other questions? Um, what's the next? Oh, um, because Hades isn't really one of the Olympians. Yeah. And you could have um put Demeter instead of Hades. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I, I kind of said that. I guess I the book Hades was called Demeter at first. I think actually, if you like go on my Instagram, you could even find a picture where of the original cover where it had Demeter in there, and they wanted me to change it. And like I said, like Hades, Lord of the Dead is a cooler sounding title than Demeter, Goddess of Grain. But I love Demeter. I think she's a really fun character. I, my favorite scene in almost any of my books is the bit where she takes her golden sickle and tries to like gut Zeus with it. Like I think she is a really fun character. And she has like the most famous, like the story of the abduction of Persephone, she's the main character. If you count the books in Hades, like the pages in Hades, it's more about Demeter than Hades, for sure. So what I'm going to do is do the book called The Mystery of Demeter, because Demeter was, this, was one of the subjects of a series of religions called the Mystery Religions. And they were like, it was a, a, an off branch of Greek mythology that's a little bit different than what we normally hear. But there's a way to make it work. So I'm going to tell that story where it's, it's more like the idea of Greek mythology from Demeter's point of view. Okay. Yeah, because every single day I get letters from someone like you, like, why didn't you do Demeter? Why didn't you do Demeter? And I feel like I'm just basically setting myself up for Demeter to kill me if I don't do something about it. It's like, I'm going to be like in a cornfield and like I'm just going to be sucked underground. It's like, oh. <laughs> do we have any other questions? Yes. <laughs> are you looking at other, at other drawings, or are you looking at other uh, just pictures of things that look similar in the old history books? Or so, um, the, my, if I should, you know, I really should include a picture of my workstation. Because, uh, so I have a big drawing board. Um, I work at about, like, the paper is, like, 17 by 15. Mm -hmm. But, like, there's a, it's probably the artwork is a little bit smaller than that. Because that's a big tip. You work big, shrink down, looks tighter than it is. Um, I have a couple of screens set up around me that show reference. And then I also have like the walls at the edges of the drawing board covered with stuff that I go to a lot. Okay. Some of that is my character design, so I can keep them consistent. When I'm doing this, I have like lots of pictures of Norway, um, lots of uh, like, like different architecture pieces and stuff. There's always something like, you could, I could draw pretty well out of my head, but it's the same thing like making up stuff. I'm going to draw better if I have something being fed to me. And I very rarely draw something exactly like what I see. It's more like flavor, like inspiration, like something that is, as I'm drawing something, like it just comes to me like from staring at these things. When I stare in, when you're working, sometimes you just stare blankly. I stare at this stuff, and it kind of helps my brain figure that out. That's a good question. I think I'm going to have to add a picture of my workstation after I clean it up, you know. <laughs> I don't too much. That's a great question. Do I take pictures of myself for references? Many artists I know do. Um, for the most part, for the figures, I don't really use reference. Um, I, when I went to school, I, I'm not, I don't draw human form perfectly by any means, but the one thing I really spotlighted when I went to art school was drawing human anatomy. I just drew, I drew from the figure all the time. Like every day, I had a group of friends we met and we posed for each other. I took an anatomy course where like we actually worked off of cadavers and they showed us stuff fits together. So I'm pretty good at making up figures. I, most of my anatomy I look at is, um, is like for other details. Like the, not anatomy, most references I do. But I know tons of artists who like straight up pose the things. It's pretty wild to see. Yes? The gods are so incredibly flawed. Is that <laughs> one of the big things that you can play on and that people are attracted to the stories? Oh, think? I think so, yeah. They're, like, a perfect character stinks, like, from a narrative standpoint. Like, you need to have these foibles and flaws to hang it on. And I think what makes the Greek gods so cool is they are that abstraction of a crazy family, like I said. Um, yeah, we all know people like this, exaggerated, but... I actually think this, like, 
so, I mean, Zeus is pretty bad, but he's not like awful, awful in some ways. Like he could be worse. I feel like most of the gods are like what a normal person would be like if they had absolute power. And I think most of us are mostly good, but we all have done a few things that really we're probably not proud of. It's just part of the human condition. And the whole thing about Greek mythology and the Greek gods in particular is they are such perfect reflections of the human condition. They're just, they're humanity writ large. And myth is, I think of myth as being true, not in the sense that these things necessarily happened, but it speaks to truths about humankind. And what I think the Greek gods do is they have captured that feeling. And that's why, like, I mean, not a lot of people worship them anymore. There's, you know, there's, I don't want to, there are people who do, so I don't want to take that away from them. But they have an amazing cultural imprint soon, I think because they remain, still, because I think they remain so relative because of those things. Yes, in the back. So I'm wondering if you have a, a favorite part of Circe uh, that she took directly from primary source material. So some of the, the Circe, so how many of you have read the book that this is the big read for? If you haven't yet, I recommend it. It's really great. And what she has done so interestingly is the netting, the, the weaving together of multiple sources, multiple primary source documents, and kind of filling in the connective tissue. And as someone who's read a lot of this stuff, I can read it and see those parts. Her depiction of Odysseus which comes largely from the Odyssey, I think really gets it. Like, he's a character who I think a lot of people write in a very simplified way, but by writing it from Circe's point of view, and where Circe has this kind of, like, and some part of her she's, like, pitying of him, but she also is admiring of him, that is fascinating storytelling. I also love the part, I think I was telling you this the other day, um, I love her descriptions of Hermes, where, like, describing, if you haven't read the book yet, she has multiple relationships with different characters at different times. And one of the, so Circe thinks she's very, well, she's been treated like she's, like, kind of ugly and maltreated in early parts of her life. And then she takes on Hermes as her lover. And Hermes is, like, this physically perfect being who's super smart and just leaves her cold. And it's, like, the idea that he's playing at being human in some way. And it's not the way I choose to see the gods, but the way that she does it, I love it. Like, I read it, and it was just like, I remember reading it and having to put the book down for a little bit after that segment to be like, I have to think on that before I progress. Because it was such an, an interesting take that I wanted to sit with it. Like, the idea, and she is of the gods, too, but she's different. And it's just so interesting to see that. And then just the ways, it's not as much from the primary source documents, but it knits the bits together. Uh, the kind of, like, exploring of the titans. I love the titans. They don't appear enough in myth. It's a tantalizing bit. Like, you know, they represent a previous form of belief that faded out, that was supplanted by the Olympians. And there are stories about them, but not enough. But she spends all this time exploring the family dynamics of the different titans. That stuff's cool. And that's a little bit less primary document as much as she knows the primary documents. And she's kind of doing, similar to what I do, Applying a human focus on these things and filling in the bits. That stuff was amazing. That was stuff I was truly envious of while reading. I'm like, wish I'd thought of that. So let's take that part off the camera. <laughs> Anything else? Well, uh, let me thank again the folks at Hope College for bringing me out here. Got to say, uh, this is my first time in western Michigan. It's really nice here. Although apparently I got the nicest weather you've ever had while I was here. Yeah, everyone else is like, no, normally it's like raining and lava and stuff. I'm like, okay, no. No, <laughs> this is delightful. And like, I've eaten like all these great restaurants. And I'm saying that as a guy who comes from Brooklyn. So like, you know, all we have is restaurants in New York. So the fact that like it's such a small place and there's like so much great food, I'm like, something's going on here. So yeah, been having a really great time. Thank you all for having me. <laughs> <laughs>